Welcome to the session on data validation. We have four speakers and a very small table, so the speakers are camouflaged on the front row here, which we know nobody would sit in anyway. Uh, but I see there's one exception. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, I'll very briefly introduce all four speakers right up front so we don't have a, a big uh, lapse in between speakers, and then I'll come to the podium and speak. So our first speaker will be Tom Pearls. Uh, Tom Pearls is professor of medicine and geriatrics at Boston University, University School of Medicine. He's also a senior attending physician at Boston Medical Center Geriatrics Teaching Service. Tom founded in 1995 and continues to direct the New England Centenarian Study. Our second speaker will be Natalia Gavrilova. Natalia Gavrilova is an expert in demographic method, biomarkers of aging, and early life effects on longevity. She's a fellow of the Geological Society of America and an editor of Demography. Uh, she's currently working at the University of Chicago, and she's been a frequent speaker, as Tom, to, to our uh, session, as a matter of as all our speakers, to our symposium. The third speaker will be Kirill Andreev. He's a Population Affairs Officer at the United Nations Population Division. Prior to joining the United Nations, he worked as assistant professor at Queen's University in Canada and as researcher and database manager at the Max Planck Institute for Demographic, Demographic Research in Rostock. His research interest covers mortality analysis, population aging, population and mortality projection, and data visualization and software applications. Finally, our closing speaker will be Jean-Marie Robin, who is an emeritus research professor at INSERM, the French National Institute for Health and Medical Research. He studies human longevity with the aim of understanding the relations between health and longevity. In particular, he measures the impact that the increase in adult life durations may have on the health status of the elderly population. In his most recent work, he takes into account climate change as well. So please uh, help me in welcoming our speakers today. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Marc. Thank you very much for the invitation to be in beautiful Orlando this time of year. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, Jean-Marc uh, gave each of us marching orders for the uh, things that we'd be talking about, so hopefully there won't be too much overlap. So uh, I think I have an, a little outline of the things I'll be talking about um, in terms of sources of invalid age claims and some red flags that we look for in the New England Centenarian study as we recruit and enroll subjects in terms of it being an invalid age claim. And what we do in the New England Centenarian study, which is composed of um, now uh, three NIH-funded studies um, around longevity and, um, uh, and also uh, some recruiting and sample size uh, challenges that we have. So uh, we had a paper, Jean-Marc, I think I emailed you this paper. I don't know if that's something we can make available that, um, that Robert Young first authored quite some time ago, I think in 2015 now, on this idea that 99% of age claims over the age of 115 are false and um, what the sources of those, uh, that those falsehoods are, and um, I'm going to go over those in a moment. But just recently, um, I think a month ago, there was uh, this Daily Mail article, yeah, December 28, 2019, uh, indicating that the island, Dominica, has the highest number of centenarians in the world, and it was made from, it was from here that the oldest person ever hailed. Born in 1875, Ma Pompo died in 2003 at the age of 128. She didn't retire until she was 104, and her next door neighbor, Rose Peter, was 118. At last count, as the article goes on to say, there were 27 centenarians, that's nearly four per 10,000 in the population, 50% higher than the next age market leader, Japan, and three times higher than Britain and the US. I'll get into her in a moment. 
So there are some, uh, and the island of Dominica as well. Um, the types of myths include uh, the religious um, or patriarchal myths, uh, for example, Abraham and that family uh, having a lot of longevity in it, uh, but Abraham living to 175, Moses living to 120. Some people have wondered if this was just an issue of time scale in, in the Bible, um, but there, that is one source of a myth. The next is the village elder myth. Um, which uh, usually you see people being claimed between 120, 160 years of age. This was Moloko Temo um, in South Africa celebrating uh, her purported 134th birthday, great deal of pride for the location, and um, uh, absolutely false. All of these were false. The fountain of youth myth usually revolves around a substance like the water in the fountain of youth. Um, uh, and uh, what Ponce de Leon was looking for in the 1500s, um, I think it was right here under the foundation of this building. And, uh, or for example, the glacial milk of the Andes, and there's actually a company that markets this stuff as being a fountain of youth. Then there's the Shangri-La myth, which isn't so much as a substance as it is an area. Um, as described by James Hilton in his 1933 book, Lost Horizon, um, or the Caucasus, um, or Villacamba, Ecuador. Um, sorry, this was the uh, water in the Hunza region, the glacial milk, which is also in the Andes. But here's a place uh, in China that a lot of people have been flocking to. Um, known as the hamlet of longevity in Bama County, China, uh, which is called China's longevity capital. And there's a place called Baimo Cave, which is said to cure everybody's ailments. Um, there can usually be quite a, a uh, tourism motive to cl these claims, and that's what's going on in Dominica. Uh, that, Daily Mail article was all about tourism to Dominica, and one of the highlights was this longevity, this purported longevity. Um, I only have two more pages of these myths, but the next one is a nationalist longevity myth, um, and the Caucasus were well known for this. There was a race between the U.S. and the and, and uh, the Soviet Union, not just the space race, but also the age race, and they were claiming uh, you know, that the Soviets were just a, a racially superior race, if you will, for, um, because of these claimed ages. And they had a, produced a stamp, which I'm still trying to find uh, on eBay, um, that, uh, of this 148-year-old. The next one is the myth of familial or I'm sorry, spiritual practice. And uh, you know, there's these swamis who claim to be 200 years old. Here's one that's 120. And they basically say it's their lifestyle and their connection to their, their spirituality that gets them to these ages. Um, there's a familial longevity myth that I hear all the time. Oh my, you know, our, we have a grandfather, great grandfather who lived to 106. I can show you the gravestone. And, and that these things run in the family and it's a source of familial pride. Um, they don't, they get pretty angry at me if I try to interrupt that idea. Um, individual or family notoriety. Uh, this woman actually showed up in Scientific American, much to my chagrin, um, claiming to be 120. Uh, and she would have had to have been 66 when she had her son, Mohammed, uh, who was 54. Um, which, if you do the math, didn't work out. Um, this method that we call familial reconstitution that was promoted by Bertrand Desjardins at the University of Montreal um, is a very helpful way to uh, rule out some of these individuals as being true positives. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, military age reporting. This tends to be very small um, age differences from reality because uh, it often has to do with individuals who are like 16 years old, but they need to be 18 or 21 to be in the war. So you see some 
changes in, uh, in ages just by these few years. But Frank Buckles, who enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1917 at the age of 16, and there was actually a lot of kids, especially in England, who were getting in the war at age 16, 17. It was kind of like a romantic notion until they got to see what the uh, front lines looked like, and then that was a very different story. World War I was fought in a very, very different way than any previous wars um, in terms of the mass casualties, where you would lose a, a, a million or two individuals in a single battle um, because of all the chemical warfare and so on and the way they fought that war. But anyway, um, his recruitment papers would have made him 115 years old when he died, but in fact he was 110. Um, when he had claimed to be 21 instead of 16. The administrative registration errors, this is probably the greatest source of uh, uh, misreported ages. And um, there is, uh, this was Damiana Seti, who died at the age of 107, but was thought to be 110 due to a mix-up with her sister, who was born two years earlier but died a few months before Damien was born. And then she took the same name as her deceased sister. So that was an easy mistake to make. Um, then there's, un and Jean-Marie Robin knows everything about uh, these kind of mix-ups. Um, then uh, there's the unreported deaths for pension fraud. There was the very famous uh, major um, debacle uh, in, in Japan where they had found um, an old man actually had his mummified body in this house. Uh, he had died at the age of 79. The family was still claiming the pension benefits when he turned out to be 111. Um, but then this, the, the, the country went back and, they, uh, and looked at other records of centenarians and found that uh, when they looked at 234,000 centenarians, um, the, status of, uh, I, there was, the status of these 234,000 was unknown and they found that 77,000 would have been 120 plus years. Um, I think they're working hard on preventing this uh, happening in the future. It turned out that many of these individuals died in World War II. So red flags. Um, my big one is a person who's like 100, and, who's older than 122, but we didn't get to hear about them when they surpassed the current record of 122, which was Jean Comin. Um, why is and that would be a, a beyond just the age claim itself. Uh, that would certainly quickly put the claim to rest. Um, uh, maternal age doesn't make sense. I already gave you one of those uh, examples. The uh, lack of early supportive documentation, especially these folks in Azerbaijan, they, they have very little of any records and maybe if anything they have a more recent record rather than old records. And then you'll see conflicting evidence like um, uh, using identity cards versus like an old census record. Um, those are pretty easy to see, find. So what do we do with the um, uh, New England centenary? So how am I doing with time? Okay, so um, that's a picture of me with Hazel at 111. Um, not her daughter, but her daughter-in-law. Kids often look quite young. Um, and, uh, and Rena, uh, one of our research uh, coordinators, um, but we just saw her uh, last winter for a study, a special study we're doing on uh, stem cells. Anyway, um, so what we do is we obtain a birth certificate always, and when a study part participant dies, we obtain their death certificate. And we can also use a national death index for those records. Uh, but in the few instances where we're just dying to um, enroll the person and a birth certificate is not available, then we'll use uh, multiple forms of uh, uh, preferably old proof, not new proof, uh, that end up corroborating with one another. And in the case of uh, people 110 and older, uh, we need both uh, forms, not just the birth certificate, but corroborating proofs of, uh, of, of their age. And also we do this um, familial reconstitution method where we make sure that the uh, ages of the um, 
older, the generation older than the person, their current generation, their siblings, and their kids all make sense relative to one another. Our recruitment challenges are now our recruitment cutoff is 103. These subjects range uh, in prevalence from 103 at about a one per 100,000 in the population to one per five million in the population when you're looking at 110 and older. We have the largest sample of these supercentenarians in the world. Um, we're now at about 120 such individuals, I think almost 125. It takes a long time to collect these folks um, because they are so very rare. Um, but uh, one of the reasons that we choose 103 and older is because these folks start getting phenotypically quite alike in terms of their delay of age-related diseases and disability. Whereas if you look at people about 100 and older, which are much more common at about one per 50,000, they can be quite heterogeneous in terms of their, date, uh, their age of onset of age-related diseases. Not so much disability. In general, they're delaying dis disability up to a, at, at about age 95. Um, but again, start getting to 103, 104, 105, they get really similar also in terms of their delay of age-related diseases. And we think that phenotypic homogeneity has an underlying biological underpinning uh, and it'd be easier with these older ages to find what those biological factors that they have in common are. Um, there's still, um, I think this is the last slide, so there's still a large frequency of unrecognized deaths on voter registration lists that makes this difficult and we have to merge with the National Death Index to, uh, to throw those out. Um, and another challenge is that about 30% 30, 30 of centenarians are in their last year of life. And um, so when you're recruiting and enrolling, uh, you may come across a lot of centenarians who are not doing well and, and would not be able to be enrolled in the study. So I think that's the uh, end of my talk. Thank you. Thank Thanks. Uh, in the order of, uh, to save time, we'll ask the questions at the end, so please write down your questions and make sure you come to the microphone to ask them. Natalia? Okay, um, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this symposium and Jean-Marc just in particular because it is very, always very, a pleasure for me to present our results uh, here for this audience. And our presentation uh, is related to the direct age validation because the problem is that the uh, United States has the largest number of centenarians among the advanced economies. On the other hand, uh, there are reasonable concerns about the data quality uh, for the, particularly at the oldest ages, at extreme ages. Uh, although uh, there are a lot of centenarians, on the other hand, it is uh, difficult to make reasonable estimates of mortality. And for this reason, we decided just to analyze uh, mortality at the end of the survival curve for several cohorts uh, in, the, uh, in the United States using data from the Social Security Administration Deaf Master File. And uh, this uh, study was supported by the Society of Actuaries, although they, of course, they don't uh, reflect uh, the opinion of the Society of Actuaries. And the study design was just to take uh, five birth cohorts uh, with a special emphasis on the 1900 birth cohort. And uh, the data, which actually we had the, the main emphasis was on the ages uh, 105 years and over, simply because our indirect estimates show that uh, the data quality gets much worse after the age 105. Uh, and before this age, it more or less okay. And for comparison, we used also ages at uh, 100 and 103, they used sample 
randomly selected uh, from the social security def master file. And uh, actually, uh, the sample size was quite big. Uh, we analyzed um, 2,700 uh, records, uh, which we directly linked to the older uh, data resources, to historical resources. Actually, Tom already outlined uh, the kinds of resources which can be used for the data validation. And uh, what we used, our main emphasis was on the early uh, the uh, historical resources such as early censuses, particularly censuses uh, which were held when uh, cent centenarians, uh, alert centenarian was child. Uh, at this age, it was difficult just to make false claims. And also, there were some several other historical resources, uh, including some military draft registration cards, civil draft regis registration cards, and some other. And we developed, uh, in order just to analyze the data, we developed the scoring system. Uh, we had uh, six uh, scores, and uh, the first two are more or less the same. They uh, considered early historical resources uh, when uh, it was easier to compare, to check the real uh, birth date. Although for most of records, there are no birth certificates, as in the United States, it, uh, this birth certification was introduced very late. Uh, so the historical early censuses were more or less, we believed that they are reasonable just to check for the age, particularly the 1900 and 1910 uh, uh, early censuses were quite good because uh, this, our centenarians and super centenarians were very young or even children at this time. And uh, we believed that the, uh, actually the age reporting at this age was more or less Correct. Uh, we also had uh, the score number three, which meant uh, <clears throat> the centenarians was found in the later sources after age, after 1950, uh, simply because uh, sometimes it looks like the data are uh, correct, the age reporting is correct, but for this we required at least uh, several uh, independent data sources, like uh, some uh, state records, or a grave index or something like this. Uh, on the other hand, there were records with questionable quality. This, first of all, uh, when data disagrees with the social security death index. But in general, I would say that, uh, of course, uh, data from the social security death index w were more accurate uh, compared to the vital statistics, because simply because if something is uh, considered uh, something refers to like pensions or some money, of course there is more check of age, just uh, less uh, opportunity for some cheating or something like this. And, but still there are uh, many cases when uh, age was misreported. And particularly this happens when uh, a person was foreign born and arrived, particularly if person arrived late. And we believe that uh, we actually considered person foreign born with an uncertain age. When person came, arrived in the United States after age 20, and there was no uh, information about the birth certificate for this person or early censuses. And, and also, this number six means that the person was not found in any source. Uh, of course, one may say that uh, this is simply because our search was not good. But we found that this is an indeed problem because it, there, uh, either there was an error in the uh, social security death index, like a cleric, clerical error, or this person simply was big uh, misreporting. So, and the reason for this was because the number of these people who could not be found in any source greatly increased after age 109. Okay, so these are our results for three birth cohorts. And what we can see here, uh, there are three birth cohorts and several ages. And what we can see from this picture shows that uh, there is increase uh, in the number of uh, questionable quality records. Uh, because here we see the proportion of records with poor quality. And it is quite clear that after at age 109 and older, there is increase in the proportion of records with poor quality. And this actually confirms our indirect uh, 
study, study of indirect quality measures uh, when uh, data become poor after age 105. And here are the oldest uh, ages, 109 and 110 and higher. Uh, it shows that the proportion is more or less the same for several birth cohorts. There is no big difference. And actually, we made, uh, we started this, uh, we made an analysis of the proportion of bad records uh, using this uh, regression with dummy variables. And what we found here is that actually there is no statistically significant difference in data quality between all five birth cohorts that we studied, although we expected that in more recent birth cohorts uh, there would be improvement, but we did not find this improvement here. And what is the only uh, statistically significant thing we saw that this is a statistically significant increase in the proportion of bad records uh, at age 109 compared to all other ages. So this is indeed shows that at uh, extremely old ages there is a big increase uh, in the number of poor uh, quality records. And how it works on the mortality curve, here is the hazard rate, a logarithm of uh, hazard rate. Uh, and what we see here is that uh, the, uh, the better the uh, data quality, uh, the higher is mortality, what, what is going on. The, Red circles mean the, uh, the best uh, data quality, and other, uh, the, the white circle shows the data are not cleaned at all. And of course, uh, at very old ages, it is better to measure mortality or hazard rate at very short in age intervals. Uh, and we see here that if we use uh, short monthly age intervals, that actually this mortality plateau disappears practically. Okay, and we had a hypothesis. Uh, if mortality deceleration is caused by poor data quality, then we uh, should believe that uh, at very advanced ages, uh, uh, mortality deceleration should be better ex uh, expressed uh, for data with poor quality compared to data with clean, clean data. And this is where continued our study uh, compared to the Society of Actuaries project when we made uh, age validation for all data beyond age 106, 106 and older. And what we found here is the data for 100, uh, 1900 birth cohort. Uh, what we can see that for many uh, data, uh, clean data, they show that uh, just pure Gompertz uh, curve. But for women, that's not so, uh, but the mortality plateau disappeared, actually. And finally, uh, our uh, final uh, question and hypothesis was what happens uh, if there is an improvement in data quality? Because we know that over time there was an improvement in data quality because people got more educated. And it was shown that uh, for data for, of better quality, uh, there should be higher estimates of mortality because it's starting with Sam Preston, what showed that age misreporting results in uh, underestimation of mortality. Okay. So we made a hypothesis that we can see uh, actually uh, higher mortality over time, if this hypothesis is correct. And here is actually, uh, I, I need to explain this question because we used 20 birth cohorts uh, for the United States and we tested two models. One model is mortality deceleration or canister model, and second uh, is the Gompers model, uh, well known for actuaries. And uh, it's interesting that over time there was kind of switch uh, between uh, the uh, canister model because for all the birth cohorts, we saw that uh, canister model fits data better because what is here on the y-axis is the archaic information criterion or goodness of fit criterion, which, shows, which is lower for better model, for better fit model. <clears throat> and what we see here, that Gompers model did not work well uh, for all the cohorts uh, approximately before uh, 1886 birth cohort. But after 1886 birth cohorts, uh, there is a switch. Uh, Gompers uh, performs better compared to the canister model. And how it looks in reality, uh, we can see here. 
uh, we can see here re really a crossover of mortality. Uh, there is one cohort is old, uh, 1881 birth cohort, and the second cohort is young, relatively young. <laughs> and uh, this is 18, 1898 birth cohort. And uh, what we can see that the mortality after age 100 uh, for the younger, for, earlier, for, for later birth cohort is higher compared to the older birth cohort, which is actually unusual uh, because everybody expects improvement, mortality improvement, and that mortality goes down. But here we see quite the opposite situation. And our impression that this happens because of improvement over time in uh, age reporting. And so uh, our conclusion is that uh, mortality deceleration is more prevalent in historically older birth cohorts when age reporting was less accurate. Thank you. Thank you so, so, we see, so we see here the impact that the wrong data may have on the medical science when you're trying to figure out uh, markers of true successful aging versus the chaff of the, the, the misreporters or in uh, uh, your conclusion you draw about the shape of your mortality curve based on, on pretty systematically wrong data at older ages and how that gives the impression of something that may or may not be there. Uh, Kira will now look at what tools on the population demographic scale uh, people look at to identify abnormality in, in what your population data tells you and what are suspicious points in your data. Thanks, Kira. Uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers of this conference and uh, Jean-Marc for setting the session on uh, data validations. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to provide some overview of some methods for data quality validations. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I will discuss some mortality adjustment procedures and I will uh, show some examples based on the real data. So I'd like to start with the typical stealth steps involved in the mortality estimation you know, over age and time. And Japan is here simply as an example of uh, such estimation procedure. The first step, we need to compute the matrix of deaths by age, cohort, and uh, time. And on this plot, this matrix is given by the Alexis uh, triangles. This is blue ones. As the second step, we need to compute the population estimates. And for ages below 80, we usually use census of population estimates and intercensual estimates. And for ages above 80, we're using usually almost seen cohort methods. So for this is a red rectangle, the data based on both on deaths and population. For this is a green area, the estimates are based only on reported deaths. And for this is yellow triangles, the estimates are based on both the deaths and survivors in the last age. So this is three different areas. And once the deaths and population are computed, we can compute uh, death rates, <coughs> life tables, and so on and so forth. And uh, the estimates will be only as good as the underlying data. If the data are bad, so estimate is bad. And the estimates are sometimes called uh, direct estimates of mortality. So there are three common problems with the demographic data. First problem is with the age reporting. Second problem is with the completeness. And third problem is the coverage. And for high longevity countries, the one we are trying to estimate the <coughs> trends at advanced ages, uh, completeness and coverage is less of a problem. So most of the talk will be focused on the age misreporting of the population data. And we distinguish two types of age misreporting. One is age keeping, and another is some general age misreporting, like age understatement or age overstatement. Age keeping is probably the oldest problem in <coughs> demography, and it's simply in tendency to run the report at age to some convenient numbers. And I provided some uh, reference to publications that you can uh, read more about it. 
It affects both self-reported data, like in census, and not self-reported data, like in vital registration. But it also common found in non-demographic data as well. And if year of birth is has to be reported, for example, in census instead of age, you can get heaping on the convenient year of birth, like 1900. Age heaping, it's, usually, it's very easy to detect visually because <coughs> by elevated counts of population, deaths and round ages. If you need to quantify effect of age heaping for, or check it changes over time, there are a number of methods is available or develop over time. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I have a slide with the references at the end of presentation if you need to learn more about it. And adjustment of the data affected by age heaping is usually done by smoothing of the underlying population. In common approaches for the smoothing are aggregation interpolation, so you put data together, for example, in wider age groups like five-year age groups and then interpolate kernel density smoothing or smoothing splines. Uh, let me show some examples. In Portugal, historical data, that provides a lot of good examples on age heaping. Yeah. So first slide shows the if <coughs> resulting mortality estimates. If you divide uh, computed by conventional methods, if you divide deaths and vital registration by census population. And in Portugal at that age, <coughs> at that time, both the vital registration and age heaping are affected by, <coughs> both the vital registration and sense population are affected by age heaping. So you can see that the, at round ages, actually, the phrase are much lower than in neighboring ages. And this is because age heaping in the census population was higher than in a, a vital registration. If you use, for example, almost instinct cohort method, you can see that the phrase at the round ages are actually higher than the rates in the neighboring ages. And this is because the population exposure is accumulated by cohorts, and this is actually reflects the age heaping and data on deaths, on in vital registration. So now let's turn, let's out turn to the general age misreporting. First of all, age misreporting at all the ages inflates tales of population and death distributions. If age at death is generally understated, the right tail of death distribution could be also still could be inflated because of the rapidly declining death distribution over age. Death rates based on the data affected by age misreporting are commonly biased downwards, and the bias is increasing with age. Age misreporting <coughs> leads to implausibly low death rates, lower rates of mortality increase over age, and in severe cases even to the declines of death rates over age. Uh, selected population, even in the same country, could be affected differently by age misreporting. And there are a few examples, I listed very few examples here that shows on selected population in different countries. For example, males and females could be affected differently by age misreporting on black and white in the United States, Han, Chinese, Maori, and Maori population of New Zealand. And because uh, Population with the bad data are affected more by age misreporting and death rates are lower. So in the high stage, you, you usually see the difference from those populations. So this kind of selections of the bad data at the high stages. And how we are going to detect the age misreporting in the demographic data? So there is no general solution, but common approaches to explore so-called plausibility of the observed data. Levels and age schedules of death rates of, could be, for example, compared, compared with the mortality in uh, countries with presumably accurate data or with data from other periods. Uh, less common approach is to conduct the matching studies that was done by Preston before and uh, what Natalia talked about. It. It's uh, much harder undertaking to do the matching or linkage, linkage studies than the first approach. Uh, I would like to mention here that detection of general age misreporting is much more difficult than detecting of age heaping. Often we cannot derive clear cut conclusions from the visual inspections of the data. The data supposedly affected by age misreporting are often argued as real data. For example, observed mortality crossovers are argued as real and explained, for example, by selection effects of the robust individuals. Let me show. Some examples of data quality indicators based on tail of 
observed distributions. When compared, for example, number of deaths at age 100 and older to number of deaths of 100, 105 and older to the number of deaths of 100 and older. Or you can compare, for example, <coughs> number of deaths 100 and older or 85 and older. This was what was done Caniston, and he was established in the Caniston Satcher data based on the old age mortality. Uh, for population data, similar estimates are usually proportional of centenarians or supercentenarians in the census data. So this is some example of the estimates of proportional of centenarians. Uh, here I selected three countries in the, around the 70s, and you can see that in Sweden the proportion of centenarians was about 16 per million at that time. In Portugal, with uh, not very good data, it was about 70. It's about three times higher. But in the 1970 census in the United States, the proportion of centenarians was a uh, whooping 500 per million. And <coughs> results of this 1970 s were widely discussed in literature. And uh, one of the reasons or main factor for such uh, bad data was put forward that uh, Questionnaire was simply not uh, misunderstood by the people who filled it, you know. And another was, reason was uh, that it was the first census in the United States and the questionnaire was automatically scanned and translated into tabulation. So it was kind of <coughs> first census that was, that been automated uh, for producing population estimates of the United States. And you can check this population for more information on this topic. Another, part, another set of the quality procedures for at all age is based on general pattern of human mortality. And this is a general pattern we are expecting, that after age 30, that uh, mortality in human population are increasing at approximately constant ratio. This is Gompers distribution. It may be 5 or 10 percent. At age about 85, uh, increases decelerating. And by age 100 or 105, this mortality is reaching a plateau. And plateau is approximately 0.7 in terms of death rates. Or oh, this is uh, annual probability of dying is about 50%. So you have 50-50 chances to survive to the next age. And remaining life expectancy is 1.4 years. And currently, there is no firm evidence that exists that mortality for humans are declines over age in any population. So based on this pattern, uh, we can derive some <coughs> procedures for the data quality validations. For example, we can visually expect the age pattern of mortality. Second, we can explore relation between different mortality indicators, between adult mortality or old age mortality. Third, we can compare the observed age pattern of mortality with age pattern expected in model life tables or in relational models. We can also expect that the age reporting in some population is better than in others. Studies of Kestenbaum, Colin, Lee are examples of such studies. And finally, I'd like to mention that the mortality crossover observed in population between countries are always uh, <coughs> suspicious of being an artifact of the bad data. And for review of the mortality crossovers, and especially racial mortality crossovers between black and whites in the United States, you can check publication of Elizabeth Arias. It was published in Longevity Encyclopedia. I have the complete reference in the end. And I, I was actually reviewing it. So let's, let's look at some examples. So this is the in the United States in the 60s. So if you tabulate data from the available vital registration, imply almost instant cohort <coughs> methods, you get such shapes of death rates. So you can see immediately that after age 100, death rates are starting to decline, for both for males and females. And at age 110, they're approximately at a level of 92 years. And here I plotted level of the so-called supercentenarian mortality that is coming from the supercentenarian studies on French or Italian supercentenarians. And this is approximately 0.7. So for the entire age range from 80 to 100, this is the difference in the United States are 
almost twice as lower. So this was undoubtedly an effect of the uh, bad data for United States. You know. And let me show you another example. And this is an example of bad data of mortality crossovers. So this is uh, 60s, and this is data for Denmark, and this is data for Russia. You can see that up to the age 80, data in Russia or mortality rates in Russia are much higher than the Danish data. But at age 80, there is a crossover, so they drop below the Danish ones. And uh, Geoffrey dissertation in Russia started in the 20s and was completed only in the late 40s. So at that time, people with the birth <coughs> certificates was 35 or younger in Russia. So for all these people above this age, they have virtually no <coughs> birth certifications. And additional evidence of the faulty data in Russia are coming with the small age heaping at different ages. So this is mortality crossover is <coughs> without any doubt it's the effect of the age misreporting in the data. Uh, looking at trends in death rates, can also, you <coughs> can also <coughs> provide some clues about data quality at advanced ages. The longest civil registration system is operating in the country, the better data quality is expected at advanced ages. Data quality tends to improve over time as birth registration covers progressively all the segments of the population. This is so-called birth registration effects. In the United States, it was... Uh, Firstly, probably described by Anderson in 1999. Uh, but improvements in data quality over time could lead to serious increases or even in stagnation in death rates, while in fact death rates were declining. So let me show one example. Uh, this graph shows trends and probability of dying from 95 to 100 in Sweden and Japan. And this is trends we actually what we expect from the trends and the good quality data. Historically, in Sweden, the probability of dying was about 90%, from 95 to 100. In the 60s, the freight started finally to decline, more or less consistently over time, and by 2015, they dropped to 82%. Historical level of Japanese mortality was virtually the same as Swedish. And here, decline started later, but was more rapid and more... <coughs> By 2000, Japanese death rates had declined to level 72%. If you look in Russia, the trend is completely opposite. This is green line, it's Russia. You know. So you can see in the 60s, mortality was uh, very low. But it was increasing in reach by 2000, the level of 90%, virtually the same level as historical mortality rates in Japan and uh, Sweden. So this is undoubtedly the effect of improving vital registration of birth registration in Russia. And only after 2000, there is some decline. If you look at the trends in the United States, they are more convoluted. Until 70, the level of mortality was very low. Then it started to decline. But in the 90s, it was increased again. And after 2000, it started to decline again. Uh, my guess for the, such trends in the United States is that the pattern is formed by interplay between two factors, both uh, by real mortality declines and by simultaneous improvements in data quality over time. And just a few words about adjusting the uh, difference for age misreporting. And common approaches is it's extrapolation. So we accept the difference up to the certain age and then they extrapolate by some mortality model like quadratic canister. Sometimes people use Gompertz. Another approach is to use the rates or age-specific rates of mortality improvement from the other population or countries, uh, maybe population with similar coverage, like, like Medicaid population in the United States. And a third approach is to use combination of these two approaches with some observed data on mortality at all the ages, like the rates in open ages, which are supposedly not affected by the age heaping. And finally, I'd like to summarize this procedures of my 15 minutes as follows. Uh, good news is that we have some data for the checking for 
HMS reporting and we have some ideas about data quality. The bad news is that uh, we, we, we don't have now a unified, unified or automated approach to adjust data for the HMS reporting. So usually it's, it's a manual work. Uh, first thing to remember that HMS reporting generally buys the smart arteries downwards and the bias is increasing with age. Second thing to remember that uh, HMS reporting, it's also biases down with mortality improvements over age. And if you apply so some extrapolative model, like Likarta model to mortality uh, <coughs> affected by HMS reporting, so future mortality report improvements will also be biased downwards, and the sizes of the old age population will be underestimated. Currently, we have reliable data on all age mortality for extended period of time for about certain countries. But as a uh, vital registration improves, so we get more and more countries with the reliable data. So the data for checking quality, they will be useful for a while for, until we get all these 200 countries with the good data. And I need to show the slide with the references. So this is all references used in publication, if you need to look more. And finally, acknowledgement for this project. This is for United Nations for making the office space and IT resources available. And Toby provided excellent emotional support for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Kira. So Jean-Marie is now going to conclude on uh, discussing Jeanne Calment. And I think something to keep in mind is the difference between a statistical outlier and a proven outlier and the difference in uh, impact that one has versus the other. That's a huge uh, presentation. Thank you. So as all the other uh, presenters, I'm very glad to be here and I want to thank the organizer and to say merci Jean-Marc. And uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, I will talk uh, on the validation of uh, uh, the ages of, of Jeanne Calment. And in the book we published 25 years ago, something like that, uh, uh, we add this uh, uh, photo uh, Yvonne Calment, the daughter, is on the front, and we have this absolutely uh, silly legend, uh, Jeanne Calment and Yvonne, uh, who is who? And uh, uh, um, <clears throat> so, uh, in December uh, last year, at the end of December 2018, beginning of uh, uh, 2019, uh, Nikolai Zak. Uh, published a paper in uh, Rejuvenation Research uh, and where he, he, he was uh, uh, claiming that, uh, in fact, Jeanne Calment was not Jeanne Calment, but uh, her daughter, with an uh, identity uh, switch uh, uh, at the time of the death, according to him, of uh, uh, Jeanne Calment at the age of uh, 99 uh, years. And so uh, back to uh, 1995, uh, in uh, 1995, officially Jeanne Calment reached the age of 120 years. Uh, I have been in charge to validate not her age, this was impossible, but to assess or to validate the quality of the administrative documents available to assess the age of Jeanne Calment. We made a report and the day after her officially 120 years birthday, we have a group of three uh, scientists, you, can, you may recognize, uh, uh, I am here. This is me, but uh, uh, you can recognize uh, 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 Jim Vopel in the back, uh, Vino Canisto, we were talking about Canisto, and uh, Bernard uh, Jeune, and they came, they checked all uh, my reports, the documents available 
uh, in the archives of the city of Arles, and they signed this letter. The letter is in, in, in French, but they, they established them, them, they, themselves as an international uh, validation uh, uh, committee, and they said we checked everything, everything is correct. So in, 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 in two words, in fact, uh, in France, uh, we, have a, we had a census every uh, five years uh, since the mid-19th uh, uh, century. And in the case of Jeanne Calment, she was born in February uh, 1875, and our censuses were usually in March. Uh, and she was uh, uh, concerned by the census in uh, uh, 1876, in March, so when she was just one year old. And from that date, from five years to five years, we have been able to follow Jeanne Calment until her death, in fact, and each time, every five years, you, you, we know exactly what age she was, living where, with who, so it was a kind of family reconstitution. So we, we had, in the case of uh, Jeanne Calment, uh, a, a, a huge amount of, uh, of data. So uh, I will not add uh, uh, about the, the pitfalls in, in uh, age validation. Tom uh, gave a very good lecture on that. I just want to, to, to say that uh, uh, most of the mistakes uh, made in uh, age validation about the supercentenarian in the literature in the past uh, uh, um, are errors due to confusions made by the validator. It was an error made by the validator between two people. Most of the time, it was between two uh, sibs, but it could have been between uh, a father and a son. This is a well-known case of uh, Joubert in, in Canada. Why trying to validate the age of someone dead? In most of the cases, for the supercentenarian, the validation has been done after the death of the person and the error was made by the validator. When validating the age of someone uh, alive, in the case of Sarah Knaus, for example, mentally alert and claiming being very old, saying, for example, I was born in February uh, 1875, such confusion cannot be the cause of mistakes in age validation. A fraudulent claim is necessary. And this is really making a big difference. Most uh, of the cases, they are just errors uh, made by validators. There is no fraud here. But in the case of uh, someone alive, you have a fraud. You have someone facing you, telling you I'm, I don't know, 115, uh, uh, and it is not true. So therefore, uh, uh, to, to support the uh, hypothesis of uh, identity switch as Zad, Zach did, one must first have a motive. What is the motive of, of the fraud? And, and Tom was given a lot of motive. In the US, for example, it is extremely important to, to get your uh, uh, Medicare uh, card and uh, uh, to say I'm 65, if, even if it's not true. So you need to have a, a motive and uh, uh, justifying such a fraud. And then uh, uh, you have also to show that such a substitution was or is practically uh, 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 possible. So as, as a motive for a fraud, in the paper published in Rejuvenation Research, uh, Zach wrote, uh, perhaps the Calment family suffered from taxation after the death of Maria Felix and especially after the death of Jeanne, father Nico, Jeanne's, uh, Jeanne's father, Nicolas Calment, the owner of land and real estate in the surrounding villages in 1931. And he, he wrote the uh, inheritance tax for the farm in Saint Martin de Croix could amount to hundreds of thousands of dollars in modern money. It is not hard to imagine that the family had neither desire or ability, nor ability to pay the tax. So, uh, 
using, you know, in France, it, I, I think it's the same maybe in Canada or at least in Quebec. I'm not sure it is the, the case in the U.S., so we will talk uh, about that. Uh, since centuries, we have a lot of administrative data registration and everything is kept in archives. So we using uh, notarial deeds, administrative and tax registration for marriage contracts, purchases, sales, shares and donations, succession, tax record, especially for the 1946 National Sol Solidarity Tax after uh, World War II. Uh, we have checked all these uh, documents concerning the family of Jeanne Calment and her daughter from 1875 to 1949. Uh, 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 and do the, doing that, and all these documents, they are publicly available. So it was absolutely not difficult for Zach to go in the archives and to ask for this uh, document. We found that uh, Nicolas Calment had given all his property to his children on March uh, uh, 1926, so five years before uh, dying, for an annual life annuity of 5,000 francs. That his children had to pay him until his death. So the only thing which occurred at the death of Nicolas Calment in 1931 is the extension or was the extension of the life annuity. So there is no financial motive for this uh, uh, identity uh, uh, switch. The practical possibility for a fraud. According to Zach, the identity switch between the mother and the daughter was possible because Yvonne, the daughter, was living far from Arles in a remote uh, village or villa. Uh, and since uh, uh, this accusation of fraud by, uh, by Zach, at least four uh, uh, relatives uh, have provided a lot, huh? in fact, a lot of photos showing that Yvonne Calment was before her marriage in 1926 and after well integrated in her social group of young uh, women. I cannot show you all the, these uh, photos. They are publicly available. Uh, they have been published as a supplementary material in a paper recently published by the Journal of uh, uh, Gerontology. Here, for example, uh, in uh, 1923, you, you can see a uh, uh, with a group of 10 other young girls uh, in a very well-known place in, in Arles. Here you can see her at her marriage, and you see the crowd at the, at the, at the marriage. And uh, when she died in 1934, the local newspaper wrote a huge crowd drove last Saturday to her last home. Mrs. Billot Calment died at the age of uh, 36 uh, years, you have a copy of, and the, if we can read on the death notice, uh, and the, the death notice of Yvonne Calment has been sent of the, of the behalf, and you can see, of 34 uh, uh, people, plus their children, plus the staff of the house Calment, plus 13 elite family, so a huge number of people, and they were asking people, they invited people to gather at the family uh, house uh, to see and to honor uh, uh, the, the dead uh, uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Bio uh, uh, Calment. So in these uh, circumstances, unless we accept the idea of the complicity of dozens of people, a substitution between uh, uh, the body or the, of, uh, uh, or the identity, the identity switch between Jeanne Calment and Yvonne Calment was virtually uh, uh, impossible. In summary, there is no financial motive for an identity switch, no practical possibility for such a switch, and during this research, we find not a lot, but we find uh, several uh, uh, evidences supporting the poor health of uh, Yvonne Calment. But should we make such a validation effort for all supercentenarians? And 
it's really time consuming, it's costly, and in most of uh, cases, in the United States, for example, it will be absolutely impossible to find such uh, documents and to, the, or to access to this kind of documents and, and, and to show that the, 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 the claim of uh, Zach was absurd. Uh, so and uh, so it's, uh, uh, so to answer this question, uh, I want to show you something. Uh, in, in, in France, we, we, we have a lot of data and good quality data for many, many years. Uh, the, the French National Bureau uh, uh, estimates that the uh, uh, data quality is good enough after 1816 to release the data. So these data are available at the Human Mortality Database. You can, you can get them. So we, we, we have data uh, uh, for France since 18. Uh, uh, 16. And what you see, the, 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 the first curve in red, a kind of, of red, is the maximum age reported at death. And, and, and you see how fluctuating uh, it is. And it's, if you want to interpret this uh, curve, it could be very difficult because, okay, you will say we have a decrease uh, at the, uh, of this maximum reported age at death during the 19th century. It is possibly some kind of uh, data improvement, so we don't, we, it's difficult, but there is very, a lot of fluctuation, and it will be very difficult also to, to, to explain this apparently so uh, rapid increase after uh, Ford War II, and more importantly, uh, for the last 20 years, a kind of plateau. And these data are used by, by people. You know, in, uh, in 2016, in Nature, we, we, we got a paper by Dong and colleagues uh, 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 claiming that, in fact, the limit of life expectancy wa uh, uh, was uh, 115. And they were using this data and to say it's clear that since 20 years, we are a kind of plateau. The limit of the uh, uh, human uh, 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 longevity is no longer increasing. But all of that is relying just of one observation by year. It's really an individual uh, observation. It is an extreme value with a lot of noise, a lot of fluctuation. And uh, if you try to have an indicator of what can be the statistical limit somewhere, uh, and there is a lot of issue, a lot of possibilities here. And we did something similar to what Can Nisto uh, was loving to do, you know, with his C indicator or R indicator, because it was possible to compute the C30, the C40, the C, like it's uh, an indicator and you can change the range of, of, of the indicator. So we, we, we started that a few years ago with uh, uh, Japanese uh, data. We are looking at the age reached by the, 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 oh, the, the people who are dying the oldest. It is the maximum uh, uh, age reported at death. After that, with also with John Wilmoth, we are looking at the second highest, at the third highest. And each time we were keeping the same kind of fluctuation, but each time we were going back, the fluctuation uh, were a little bit smaller. But after that, we were changing the, the, the way to think and say, can we look at the highest age, providing at least five deaths, or at least 10 deaths, or 25 deaths, to, to, to have a more stable information, but staying very close to, to the uh, uh, maximum age reported at death. And here, so it's very subjective because uh, it's empiric, it's empiric. I have no good reason to have selected this one. So this one, uh, the APAL 30, is the highest age providing at least 30 deaths. And we stop uh, when the next age is no longer providing at least uh, 30 deaths. And doing that in France, look, all the fluctuation uh, uh, disappeared. And we got this absolutely impressive result from 1916 to 1946, so after World War II, we have only three values for the uh, uh, highest age providing at least uh, uh, 30 deaths. It is 99 years, most of the time, 
and sometimes 98 and sometimes 100. And one, only in one occurrence, really at the beginning, in 1817, we have 101. So you see how regular it is. And this is really fitting well what we can read in the literature at the beginning of the century or uh, th that the, the limit of the human longevity is constant. You know, it was the basic idea. But after that, after World War II, you see this huge increase and so regular, linear. So the interpretation is totally different if you are looking at a statistical indicator of the limits of the human uh, longevity, or if you are looking at the last value, at an individual uh, 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 value. And just, uh, so this is uh, the, the, the general context, but everything I was saying was without Jeanne Calment. And if we are adding Jeanne Calment, we can see that, in fact, even if she uh, belongs to this uh, extreme value, among this extreme value, they are, she is absolutely exceptional. So because that, yes, in the case of Jeanne Calment, it is, it was possibly correct to have this kind of exceptional uh, data validation and to answer to the uh, 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 challenge or accusation, I don't know how to say, uh, 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 of uh, Zach. But happily, we were in France. We had the possibility to access all these uh, documents. But I don't think that for, uh, uh, let's say, a regular uh, super centenarian, you have to do this kind of uh, uh, age uh, validation. I think that if you can get the birth uh, certificate, the birth record, and some documents show, uh, tracing the, the, the person during uh, his or life, it will be uh, uh, enough and improve a lot uh, the, the data quality in the US, for example. Okay, thank you so much. So we have time, uh, not much, but uh, for a few questions. Uh, please come to the microphone if you want to ask a question. And I'll pass the microphone to whoever uh, you want to ask a question from. If you guys could come up top. Natalia, Kirill, I'm Jamai, only you going want? to use this microphone for a second because uh, before the questions, we have a little gift for Jean-Marc. Um, <laughs> It turns out, besides loving bird watching, it, he really likes Legos. And I don't know if this is, he's just a kid at heart, or, but, uh, but not only Legos, but also dragons. And then we found one at the Lego store here about dragons. And I, there's some story about dragons that I don't understand that you like, but. Yeah, the, the thing about dragons is I use St. George and the Dragon a lot in my illustration on especially fighting cancer, fighting heart attack, or whatever. It's a good, uh, you know, it's, it's a common topic in art, and usually they're pretty. And there was a huge Lego structure in front of the Lego store of St. George fighting the dragon, which I made the mistake of pointing out. We, we, <laughs> we couldn't afford that one. We but we could, here's that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.